Um, hi, I'd really like to thank all of you for coming out today. It's really exciting. Um, I'm happy that the room is relatively full. Um, so I'm going to be talking about how insects and other arthropods use chemicals to defend themselves and to capture prey and talk a little bit about evolution along the way. But I really want to get this out of the way first, right? Because everyone's like, I saw this really poisonous snake the other day. And there are snakes that are poisonous, but it's not most of them. So poisonous is that if you bit it and then you keeled over and died, right? So this would be like the poison dart frog. Don't lick the poison dart frog. Venomous is if that toxin is actually injected into you somehow. So here's the question you should always ask yourself if you're like, is this creature venomous or poisonous? If you bit it and died, then it is poisonous. If it bit you and you died, then it's venomous. <laughs> so one of the important things to remember as we're going along the way is what is your purpose? Why are you creating these chemicals? The first one is you gotta eat. If you can use venom, or another chemical to help you kill your prey, then you don't have to overpower it with strength. This is how ants take down beetles, like twice their size. This is how ants can actually attack lizards and eat them. The other option is you just don't want to be eaten. Being eaten is generally not great for your survival. Um, so if you can create some sort of chemical that smells bad, that tastes bad, that just outright kills whatever you're trying, whatever's trying to eat you, uh, then you can, then you're a little bit better off in life. So I'm going to provide two examples that can be found here in Georgia. And the first are centipedes. This is a really beautiful blue species that we have here. And they're fast, right? Centipedes are fast. They have this seek and destroy kind of attitude, kind of mission. They just run at their prey. They have these modified forelegs in the front of their mouth that are actually now fangs that inject venom. So they just run after their prey, like kill it with their venom, and then they eat it. A lot of people are afraid of centipedes. You shouldn't pick them up. They can hurt you. But they also eat cockroaches, so they're great to have around your house. The other option are millipedes. This is one that I dug out of a log and I kept as pets, and I'm really excited because they made babies. Yay! Anyway. <laughs> Um, so millipedes are quite the opposite. They curl into these little balls when they're disturbed. And they, um, and they actually excrete various toxins in between the segments of their body. So the centipede is venomous. It injects, that veno it injects that toxin. And the millipedes are poisonous in the fact that they just excrete it through their skin. So now I want to move on to evolution and talk a little bit about these chemicals and kind of where they sit in evolutionary trees. The biggest thing that I have seen with students or with the public talking about evolution is that evolution is a process from bad to good or from worse to better. And that's not necessarily true. A lot of evolution is random. The, there, the frog that you see up there is no better or worse of an organism than the flower, which is no better or worse of an organism than the butterfly. They're just different. So we're going to talk about so how some of these differences show up and just talk about a little and just talk about some of these differences. So I'm going to talk about spiders at first. I have one with me. I will walk the animals around after the talk, so stay tuned. Um, spiders really just don't bite people. Um, I know your second cousin's grandmother's twice removed swears that she got bitten by a spider and it was like the most grossest, nastiest thing on her arm. She most likely had a bacterial infection and was too embarrassed to say that she didn't use Neosporin. The fact of the matter is spiders just rarely bite. Unless they're in your shoe or in your glove and you put your glove or your shoe on without paying attention, they, they have plenty of behaviors to tell you that they're not going to bite you. And I will talk about some of those behaviors when I walk around the tarantula. But they're very sweet. So here's your typical spider. You've got your eight legs, you've got the fangs in the front. Those fangs in science are called chelicerae. That is how they inject the venom. So those are hollow tubes. They're very much like snake teeth. And they just like grab into their prey and then inject that venom. And I know spiders look very scary, but I promise that most of them look like this. And they're really cute, right? So this is a jumping spider. I think this one is specifically from Oklahoma, but we have them all around the United States. They're only millimeters big. They're about that big, and they're adorable. So that's what spiders really look like. 
So I just want to go over a couple of species. What's going to happen here is you're going to see some species show up, and you're going to see a lot of names of chemicals. I don't want you to pay attention to those names other than to realize that these names are different. Just kind of realize that they have a diversity of things in them. So the first is everyone's favorite, the black widow. I moved down south, and I was like, you're going to see black widows everywhere. I found one my first year of grad school in a mailbox. So um, they have a whole host of stuff in them. First you have digestive enzymes which help breaks down the tissue and then they have all these neurotoxic proteins. The neurotoxic proteins that they have are pretty much all of the same class. They do basically the same thing. They just target different groups. They target various arthropods, both crustaceans and uh, insects and they also have one that affects vertebrates. Um, if, you find, if you get bitten by a black widow, I had a friend who got bitten by a black widow because he's an idiot, and <laughs> true story. Um, if you're a healthy adult, which it looks like everyone here is a healthy adult, good job, um, you are most likely not going to die. Your life is going to suck for a few hours, it's not going to be great. I would go to the hospital to make your, like, your life that's sucking suck a little less, um, but by the next day you'll be fine and you'll walk it off. Um, the second one is the brown recluse spider. That's the one that everyone talks about around here. It's actually very localized to central and southern the United States. We're actually too far south in Athens to have them here. So you aren't going to find it. Everyone tells you that they found a brown recluse because there's literally about 30 other spiders that are not dangerous that look exactly like this. Um, you can actually tell the difference based on the eye placement. So unless you have a picture of the eyes, you cannot tell. All right, so the brown recluse is actually particularly interesting. It is unlike any other spider. The stuff that's in it that you know kills its prey is very, very different. It has this sphingomyelinase D, which is basically a protein that just takes that outside phospholipid bilayer that we are talking about in his video, and it just makes that break down. So, you know, your inside of your cells just leak out of the outside of your cells. And then the tumor necrosis factor makes your cells on the inside go into program cell death. So your cells are actually breaking apart from the inside and the outside at the same time. The two other things that are in it actually just help that venom circulate through your bloodstream better. So, again, you probably won't die if you're a healthy adult. You should still go to the hospital, right? And then finally, I'm going to talk about the Sydney, uh, the sp Sydney funnel web spider, and that's actually the first picture that I showed you with its fangs all up in the air. It was like, Grr. yeah. Um, so the males can actually do more damage to you than the females. It lives in Australia. As you can imagine, it's deadly, right, Australia? And it has robust toxin in it. And this toxin um, pretty much floods your neurotransmitters and makes them overactive. And so you would actually die because of, um, because of respiratory failure. Um, and actually, that's, pretty, that's the case in the Black Widow, too. It uses a slightly different mechanism. It floods your body with neurotransmitters. And both of those spiders, using different venom, shut down your muscle communication system. And because they're shutting down your muscle communication system, you can't breathe anymore. And that's a problem. So the Sydney funnel web spider is deadly, but they made an anti-venom in the late 70s, early 80s, I think, and no one has died since. And actually, I was reading earlier, this is really funny, only in Australia, they're like, we're running low on anti-venom. If you find this poisonous spider, or this venomous spider, can you please come and like bring it to us so we can milk it for venom, so we can make more anti-venom? Like, go catch this deadly spider. Okay, thanks, Australia. <laughs> All right, so now I'm gonna talk about walking sticks. I have a bunch of walking sticks with me. That's actually three out of the four containers up here. And I will bring those around and we'll talk about them and they'll be super fun. Um, so walking sticks, so here's an example. This is O. Puana, and it releases a chemical through its thorax. All, all stick insects have the ability to release a defensive chemical from their thorax through a special gland. This. This walking stick is actually very interesting because this quinoline is not found in any other animal on the planet thus studied so far. What's interesting about this is not only is it an excellent repellent for spiders and ants, it's very chemically structured, 
uh, it was very similarly chemically structured to nap, nap, yeah, naphthalene, napathylene, naps, napathylene. Thank you. I learned it wrong once, and you know when you learn something wrong once and then you can never pronounce it again? Yeah, here we are. Anyway, so that doesn't sound like very much, but that's the main chemical in mothballs. So it's actually producing a chemical that's very, very similar to what we use to also repel insects. This is the two-lined walking stick. We have it here in Georgia. You probably haven't seen it because it lives in the way in the top of the trees. And here is a picture of it. It has been dissected. Those two big lobes are the defensive glands. So you can see how big they are. This one releases a type of modified glucose molecule, which is also an insect repellent. It is also, this particular molecule is found in other insects. It is also found in the mint plant. And it is very chemically similar to catnip. So in addition to getting your, in addition to catnip getting your cats high, this is a really good insect repellent. So, and then the third one that I'm going to talk about, I actually have here today. If you saw the flyer, this is what was on the flyer. This is, this is the Peruvian walking stick. We aren't sure exactly what's in it right now. Um, we do know that the molecular weight of the chemicals that are in it are very similar to the two-lined walking stick. So we're assuming that has basically the same chem chemical pro uh, same chemical properties, but we're not exactly sure what those are. So in summary, spiders all inject their venom through those big fangs in the front, but they have a variety of different chemicals that they use. In addition, the walking sticks have this defensive gland, and you can see there's an arrow pointing to one that has a particularly large opening. And again, the, that, all these chemicals come out of that same mechanism, but the chemicals, again, are diverse. And they're, they're fairly poorly studied, so I picked these two because these are the ones that we know. Most of the other ones we don't know yet. And now I want to talk about my favorite, favorite kind of evolution, and this is convergent evolution. And convergent evolution is when unrelated organisms develop similar traits because of the environment or because those things just happen to work very well. And a good example of this is several different insects and different lineages. You have a butterfly that looks like a leaf, you have a katydid that looks like a leaf, you have a mantis that looks like a leaf, and you have a stick insect that looks like a leaf. And these are, these are very, very unrelated in evolutionary terms. But they all have tried to look like their environment. So be before us talking about how you have a structure and the various chemicals, now I'm going to talk about a chemical that's admitted, administered through different structures. So the first is hydrogen cyanide. Hydrogen cyanide is really, really bad for you. Um, it's found in peach pits and very small quantities of it are very, very toxic. So this, so what happens is the, you have your cell, your mitochondria powers your cell. That's what pretty much makes the energy for your cell. Hydrogen cyanide blocks it up and it explodes and then stops working because it's currently exploding. So not great. <laughs> um, this particular millipede uh, is not found here, um, but its relatives are. This one can produce 600 micrograms of, of hydrogen cyanide, and that's enough to kill a pigeon 18 times over. Fortunately for us, it only releases one one hundredth of the lethal dose for us, so just don't lick a hundred of them and you'll be fine. <laughs> um, here's a similar species that I found here. Many of them glow in the dark or uh, are fluoresce under UV. This is because the animal is trying to tell you, hey, in all spectrums, I can really ruin your day. Please don't eat me. <laughs> and um, so this is a species that I actually dug out of log here. And you say, like, why glow under UV? Well, insects and birds can both see UV. So even if the lighting conditions aren't great and you can't see the black and orange, hopefully you can at least see the glowing blue. Another insect that releases hydrogen cyanide is a stink bug. It doesn't release enough to be dangerous, but that's one of those chemicals that makes up its really gross, pungent smell. I'm not sure if you guys have smelled it, but I got one stuck in my hair two days ago, and it did not smell great. Um, they release hydrogen cyanide through holes on the side of their abdomen, and pretty much all of their smelly, gaseous mixture comes out as a gas. The millipede excretes it 
in between the segments. And I have a picture of that coming up. Um, this is a burnet moth. It is very bi vibrantly colored. If you're getting anything from here, you see like the colors are just like, hey, don't eat me. Um, these guys actually just store it in their blood uh, because no big deal. And so uh, they're trying to war warn like literally everybody, please don't eat me, like you'll really die from me. Um, and then this one is my favorite. This is a beetle that lives in Australia because of course Australia. And it sticks, it, so the bottom is the adult, the top is the larva. The larva sticks its butt up in the air as kind of a warning. It's very, very obvious against the leaves. If something comes too close, it literally farts hydrogen cyanide in the attacker's face, <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> All right, so now I'm gonna talk about a different class of chemicals, which are benzoquinones. Benzoquinones are often used in arthropods because this is a chemical in the chemical pathways to harden that exoskeleton. So you already have it in you, you're already hardening your exoskeleton. If you can just keep more of it and store it, then it's great. Benzoquinones are also great because they work against a wide variety of animals. So they work against other insects as a repellent, they work against vertebrates as a skin irritant. So here's a picture of a millipede that's actually excreting these. We have these here, these are in the North American millipedes, and you can see the drops of liquid death coming out of them. Here is a type of cockroach. This is on indicator paper. Um, the image is from a paper from like the 50s, so black and white photographs. But, it, so, but what they did is they squeezed the leg of the cockroach and it turned and it shot the chemicals out of its butt. Um, seems to be a recurring theme in insects. <laughs> and so it shoots the chemicals out of its butt with a pair of anal glands. This is a lubber. We have these here in Georgia. If you're one of the unfortunate few who the lubbers happen to love your backyard, you probably see them all the time. They produce benzoquinones in a froth that's right underneath their wings. And finally, this is the bombardier beetle. It lives here. It lives in many places all over the world. And this shoots a chemical compound of benzoquinones and also hydrogen peroxide at high speed out of its butt at the temperature of boiling water. I see, out of the butt, right? Like this, is, this is a recurring theme. So this is actually pretty close to the chemical reaction that is happening inside that beetle. So we're gonna talk about how it does that and like, you know, doesn't explode. So this is the bombardier beetle. This is a South American species. This is our very pretty diagram of what the inside of it looks like. You'll notice that all of the business stuff of the beetle is located in the back end. Good to keep all these chemicals away from your face. So the first thing is they have a reservoir. This reservoir is like a, it's just like a pocket. It, it's, it has a soft membrane. It's not heavily armored or anything. And it's holding hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinones. These hydroquinones later become the benzoquinones. And this hydrogen peroxide is stable without a catalyst. So it's just hanging out in this reservoir. Then you have the reaction chamber. It is heavily armored. It's made out of the same stuff that that beetle shell is made out of. So this is where all the stuff is happening. You don't want, to, you don't want your insides to explode. Here you have the catalyst and the enzymes that actually make the hydrogen peroxide come out at boiling temperatures. So this is a, an, an amazing system, right? The fact that you can have a two-chambered reservoir, you can have all these chemicals inside of you and like somehow not die. So it's so amazing that there are two distinct groups of this bombardier beetle. And the first is these posanines. So this is a subfamily. I, you don't really need to like, just look at that there's a big red block and it says like a name, right? Okay, big red block. This is what one of them looks like. I love to show you all these cool photos and all these cool videos of it, but this lives in ant mounds and getting to them is surprisingly difficult because then you have to get through the ants to get them. So there aren't actually very many pictures or videos of them. But what happens is in this beetle, the, when they shoot that mist out, it runs along the length of the shell. And they use that shell as the dispersal mechanism. And when they, when they discharge, it's one big and that's it, one shot fired. 
This group is the kind that we have like around here that you've probably actually noticed. This one actually lives in Georgia. Um, this one, as you can tell, looks a lot different. Its shell is really short. It has like a nozzle on the end of its bum. And when it fires, it goes like a machine gun. And so, so people thought like, oh, clearly you had this like, you know, this one that just missed. And then clearly we evolved this, this better one. But actually, because this common ancestor, way the, way the crap over there, um, doesn't have either the two chamber system or any of these chemicals. So people are now thinking because the mechanism for distributing or releasing these chemicals is so different that they're actually, this, this process evolved twice, which is just awesome and so cool. But you're probably tired of me like, talking about some taxonomy. So here's what happens. This is what's happening inside the beetle. Every time you see a pulse is a droplet of that hydrogen peroxide solution dripping into that reaction chamber. And that's the pulsing that you see of these mini explosions. Um, the beetle can shoot up to 70 times at a rate of 500 pulses per second. And if you want to know what that looks like, it looks like that. This hurts. <laughs> They li this, not this, this species doesn't live here, but the red and black one that I showed you earlier, that one definitely does. When you, if you pick it up, you can hear it pop as it's doing this, and you can see the cloud. Like this, this is a very real representation of what happens. It, it's, it doesn't hurt that bad. It's like, you know, it's like getting boiling water dripped on you, but that's about the extent that it does. I'll take questions in two seconds. No worries. I'm, glad, I'm excited for your enthusiasm, so hold on to it. Um, so basically, in summary, so this group you have a, for this type of evolution, you have um, two chemicals that we looked at. We looked at hydrogen cyanide and benzoquinones, and the chemicals are the same, but the mechanisms for releasing those chemicals are different, which is different from what we talked about in the beginning of the talk, where the structure was the same and the chemicals were different. So I hope this gives you proof that living creatures are chemical systems. I actually have this guy with me here today. So. And with that, I'll take any questions. <laughs> uh, he had his hand up first. Thank you. He had his hand up first, so I have to. So the bottom of your beetle, when it's shot, it looks like it got all over itself, too. Probably. Yeah. So its exoskeleton protects from that. Yeah, its exoskeleton protects from that. See, you would think that, um, <laughs> but insects are so diverse. Beetles are the most heavily armored in general, um, but there's different amounts of how that exoskeleton is hardened. So for example, termites, are they, they eat your house, which is amazing because they're actually really bad at being alive. Um, if you leave them out, like, like we, we have them at UGA in the lab, and it's like, oh, we have this termite. We left it outside for five minutes. It's dead just because it like dried out or got slightly too hot or something. Um, so, and so yeah, so other insects, most have the exoskeleton, not all of them are quite as, um, as strong as the beetle. Also, this would hurt us, right? This is, this is really good against vertebrate predators. Beetles, some of their main predators are other insects, but also small mammals, reptiles, and birds. And this shooting hot anything at a reptile or a bird would not be great for that reptile or bird. You were next, I think. Yeah. Um, for that uh, moth or butterfly mm -hmm. that you said was it had the cyanide in its blood. Yeah. What does it have in its blood that makes its own mitochondria not explode? Um, okay, so insects are really weird on the inside. Um, so we have blood vessels, right, and that keeps our uh, insects. On the other hand, their blood is just, they're like a balloon. They're filled up with blood. Um, and it's mainly just a sugar molecule. There's a couple things in it for, uh, to, like in a, for a small immune system. But for the, for the most part, insect blood isn't, isn't like ours. There's, there's not like, they don't have like blood cells, for example. So the cyanide doesn't like go into their cells at all when it's like sloshing. So it actually hasn't been studied very much, which, yeah, is, uh, this is pretty much like, I give this cool talk and then people ask me all these awesome questions and I'm like, well, actually, like, it was looked at once by this person in the 30s. Um, yeah. 
Um, and we're, we're not really sure how that's possible. Um, we're, we're, if I were to guess, so the monarch butterfly is also really toxic. It has a, like, um, the orange and black coloration. They have um, cardiac glycosides inside of them. And that makes, uh, when you eat it, um, that makes you vomit. It has, it has all these like really ne detrimental effects. Um, but those are also stored in the blood. Um, and then, so it's interesting because the caterpillar, which also has those and it, actually excretes it through the exoskeleton. So there might be something like that too, where it's just being like excreted into the exoskeleton membrane. Because the exoskeleton has all these layers and it's really complicated. Yeah. So that first group of bottom beetles you mentioned. Yes. Now? Yes. What are they doing in the They're eating the ants. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what they're doing in there. Um, they're, they're not very well studied. Again, like people from the 30s or 40s or whatever study them. But um, so it's really cool because ants have all, the, all, this, all these chemicals on them called hydrocarbons. And that's how not only one ant species tells itself from another ant species, but how one ant colony tells itself from another ant colony. And these beetles like coat themselves in these hydrocarbons and just like walk into the ant mound and then like eat the ants. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, you mentioned that there are certain like behaviors or morphologies that spiders have. Yes. They, they aren't prone to biting. What, what right. So are. yeah. So I can walk around my tarantula and I'll show you. Um, so spiders when they're relaxed will keep all their legs out and they're all like very happy. Um, next step is the, when they're scared they'll like run away. So they'll just run away. If you've backed it into a corner, it'll then be like, please don't hurt me and curl into a little ball. And then after that, if you keep harassing it, it'll be like, fine, that didn't work. And then do the opposite approach. It'll throw its front legs up. It'll throw its fangs up and be like, like really, like, please leave me alone. Look at how huge and scary I am. If you're still messing with a tarantula by that point, uh, the new world tarantulas have the ability, the ability to throw hairs off of their abdomen. They'll do that next. They'll throw these hairs off. It gets in your skin. It kind of feels like fiberglass. Then they'll be. Then they'll bite you. So you have to go through like five defensive behaviors before they'll actually bite you. The main reason for this is venom is expensive. So that's one thing that I didn't talk about here is that all of these chemicals biologically are very expensive to make. You don't want to waste them if you don't have to. The spider knows it can't eat you. Questions? Yeah. Are there biotech companies inspired by insects or spiders? Are there bio, uh, probably. Um, I can't think of any, any offhand. Sorry, I just don't know. <laughs> yeah. So intelligent design creationists love bombardier beetle because yes. they say that system that you just showed us is irreducibly complex. Yes. You couldn't have evolved it through natural processes. Right. How do you address that? All right, so first one, that, two, that dual chambered system, I already showed you that it arose twice in the beetles. Remember that millipede that I showed you? It also has a two chambered system to keep the hydrogen cyanide out of its bloodstream. Um, spiders, they have a two chambered system for silk. You don't want your silk being stuck inside of you. So this two chambered system shows up multiple times different insects. Um, also there is a um, bombardier beetle that I didn't talk about which also lives here and that one has um, is it is in the same group as the flanged ones. Hold on, let me go back. Back. Okay, so they're in the same same group as the Pacinis. Um, they're actually at the top of that phylogenetic tree. You just can't see it because that wasn't the important part. And they they produce an ooze of this of this chemical. It's hydrogen peroxide and it's um, and it's uh, and it's the hydroquinones that later become the benzoquinones and they release it and it kind of froths up on their outside and then it oozes over and they just take that and they like rub it on their body. So it's kind of like the step down and we know that it's evolutionarily related to the pawsines. So it's still useful even though you can't shoot it? Yeah, it's still useful even though you can't shoot it. Um, and, then, and then as we talked about with the other ones, all of these guys uh, all of these guys also just use benzoquinones. They're useful even though they're not hot. So, yeah, it's one of creationist favorites. 
Although it can still be explained by science, yes. Have you read anything about whether or not they're reconsidering the phylogeny of the two different subfamilies of the bombardier beetles? Actually, I just read a whole ton of papers about this. <laughs> um, so there's this really famous uh, scientist who studies the, studies the bombardier beetles, and I was just reading her most recent paper. And so it was thought for a while that the, the posinines and um, the procrinines were um, one evolved from the other, or they were in that same tree. And she recently just separated them. And the big thing was like, well, then you'd have this bombardier beetle that has convergent evolution that people, even scientists, had trouble believing. Um, and she, she did all of this work that's where um, this video came from. This video came from her most recent paper, which came out earlier this year. Um, and the, the whole idea behind that was, you can't have this jet propulsion system because then you need a muscle to close the bottom of the, like, to close that system off. So to get that poof, poof, poof. And what they found was, is actually most of this is sclerotized. It's the word we use for hardening the exoskeleton. So most of it's hard, except it has one little membrane on the side that's soft. And what happens is the, a drop comes in, the explosion happens, it forces that membrane open, all the stuff falls and comes out of the back of the beetle, and because that explosion stopped, the membrane shuts again, because there's no pressure. And so you can do all of that without creating new muscles. As, we, as one of the things that's difficult to argue for in evolution, creating new things is harder than losing things. And so this whole argument was like, convergent evolution definitely could have happened. You didn't have to create a novel structure. Yes? Speaking of creating new things being hard. Um, yes. Are there precursors to these um, poisonous and venomous or destructive molecules that are like, naturally found in other biological chemical components? Components. Um, so that's what I was talking about with the benzoquinones is they're already used to harden the exoskeleton. In the bombardier beetle, um, the hydrogen peroxide is also part of that system. So they're already, those are specifically already in the insects. Um, the hydrogen cyanide is a little bit, uh, we don't have all the answers to yet. Um, a, lot, a lot of this is, right, we can only study species now that have these things. We can't go back to that common ancestor and just, like dig up a fossil and start doing chemistry on it and see like, what, did you have any like precursors? What were your genetics? So it's a little bit harder. But some things like the benzoquinones showing up in so many different insects, we know that it's used to harden the exoskeleton helps us answer those questions. Yes? So for the Uriurus milk beans around here? Yes. Do they, do they glow in the dark? They, the so they glow under UV lights. So that one was UV. Um, there are some in California which do just glow in the dark straight up. And there are, there are videos. I'm not sure if there's videos, but there are definitely pictures of it. I think the genus Myotoxa might be the genus. So. You know, uh, the, the thing that makes them glow in black light, is that a directly correlated with how toxic they are? Is it like a byproduct or part of that thing, or is it just something for like a color of bottom? Yeah, so. Um, that's actually a great question because that's a very similar question that I'm waiting to answer for on my blog. Um, someone, so scorpions glow in the dark uh, under UV light actually as well. We aren't sure why they do it. We're not exactly even sure the proteins that help them do it. Um, so one of the questions that I got from my blog that I'm still researching is why do pseudoscorpions, which are not related to scorpions, why don't they glow? And um, basically going through the literature is like, we don't really know, no one's really looked at it, because glowing stuff is cool, but it's not really funded. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> stuff. So like, yeah, this is why I love talking about insects, because I'm like, everyone's like, why do you study insects? And I'm like, well, because we, do, we literally know like nothing about them. So if you want to know stuff about stuff, join entomology. <laughs> do you have any other questions? All right. Cool, I'll like start walking some bugs around. We have the place until like 7.40, right? Yeah, we have a good 22 minutes. Yeah, so why don't we take some bugs out, yeah.